Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox here. This is uh, starting uh, a new section of the Big Data Open Source Software course. In particular, it goes through all the technologies in what we call HPC, ABDS, and gives you sort of roughly one page on each technology. And if you remember, we uh, divided these technologies into 17 levels. Uh, the first four levels are done together in this particular presentation. These correspond to the cross-cutting levels. Here is the, the uh, list of all these uh, software packages. We're going to do these four in this presentation. And then actually in following presentations, we're going to loop around here. This is level five and up to the top, which is level 17. And the total number of packages here is over 200. Which I keep adding, I add from time to time things here. Maybe it's stabilizing a little. Anyway, it's quite a lot of stuff here. So, <coughs> here are the levels or layers in detail. We have the 17 layers. And I said we're doing the first four here. And remember the first four of the cross cutting. Then we start at the bottom of the diagram with the infrastructure and then go to the top of the diagram, which is the workflow and orchestration level. We will use uh, this, this particular slide as a divider between the layers, of what here is called functionality. And uh, we will highlight which ones uh, we do. So first, we're going to do level one. And that's messaging and data protocols. So here we have actually three particular technologies, Thrift, Protobuf, and Avro. The, uh, Thrift and Avro are Apache. And as in these slides, we try to give you a reference. Um, and of course, a title. And then we have some uh, words here, which are often uh, copied from or slightly edited from online resources uh, to do 200 software packages all from scratch would be a major effort. <clears throat> and I should point out we haven't used or I certainly haven't used many of these packages. And these three here in this category here are all aimed at the same general problem, an area that's um, been in importance for a long time. We need to um, Communicate by messages between particular components, often services. Um, they sometimes use the so-called remote procedure call uh, uh, approach, and sometimes uh, just simple messaging, as in web services, which doesn't use RPC. And uh, Thrift, like many Apache technologies, was originally developed uh, commercially. This one from Facebook. and. <coughs> It actually has not only the uh, protocol, namely how it's actually written, um, how you actually produce these messages, and also it gives you some code. So it actually has a software stack with uh, various uh, languages. Um, all the ones we want are certainly here. Um, doesn't have Fortran, but we shouldn't want to use Fortran probably. Um, this whole field was very popular for the, um, the, the days of object-oriented things like CORBA, uh, distributed object technology, because those distributed objects had to communicate in some way. And indeed, web services spent a lot of effort uh, on, the, on the format of messaging and how to do this. Here, this is interface definition languages, and that's the how the languages interface. Uh, how from a given language you actually uh, write the information to the message and then a binary communication protocol, that's how the message is formatted. And here's a nice picture of, the, uh, of how this works. You uh, have a client and you have a server, you're generating um, the, uh, um, you're generating here a stack, which eventually sends messages back and forth. Um, notice that this is somewhat independent of serialization. Um, 
If you have a language like Java, which is quite complex and has lots of implicit or explicit links between objects and things like that, you need to serialize Java, and there are various ways of doing that with different efficiencies, uh, which actually are not. Uh, and if you have a particular application, you may wish to choose a particular serialization method. So this is independent of the serialization. Here we have, uh, this is not Apache, this is an open source uh, um, technology called Protobuf, which is uh, actually what Google uses. <coughs> Um, and it's uh, and it's solving this same problem of serializing structured data because you often have this problem that you have a sophisticated uh, object or or class with uh, lots of nifty fields and things like that, and how do you uh, communicate that information between two services, which might even be in different languages, and. Um, so you need both the, uh, you need to be able to write out the information to the messaging system, that's the IDL, interfa interface definition language. And you have to, and you, and you need to transport it. So it has a binary wire format. Um, and notice this is not self-describing, then you have to know that you're sending protobuf so that when you read it, you know it came from protobuf and you can, um, Decode it. This is uh, C++, Java, and Python, the sort of base languages that uh, are central to the uh, to the web, or to the cloud, you should say, or to the Apache stack. And uh, it says here that the one important difference is that protobuf is just the interface and the and the protocol. It does not have the actual software stack implementing this. You have to write the software stack yourself. Google didn't release that. Here is the final technology in this set of, um, of uh, interfaces. And it's sort of a nice contrast to Thrift. It's called Avro, it's also um, an Apache system. And it aims to be more efficient than um, um, than the others by actually generating a schema, which schema is uh, used to read and write the data. And that makes it um, more efficient to, to implement the, both the serialization. Um, and uh, the schema is typically attached to the file, so the whole file can be processed later. It's not attached to every data point, it's just attached globally to the file that's uh, transported by Avro between two, either between a disk and a program or a vice versa. Um, and here you see that you do, if you, this, this is the way the schema is used. You have a handshake to get the, to get the uh, communication between uh, server and client or client, server and server going. The initial handshake that defines the format of the remaining messages. And that's that initial handshake exchanges the schema, which is then used forever. And um, it is points out that um, the data is always attached with this schema at, um, exchange at the beginning. And um, you can then uh, process the data without generating code. And so this allows a much more flexible, uh, dynamic, uh, typing of doing arbitrary uh, um, classes with particular complex data structure. And uh, because of the fact that the schemas uh, exchanged at the beginning, then it makes it very efficient. You just write out everything in flat in a very uh, uh, opaque binary fashion, which needs the schema to interpret it. And um, there are no, everything is labeled so that when you change the schema, and then you can use all the new schemas, you can do a translation between the schemas. So Avro has somewhat different trade-offs from Thrift, but is trying to solve essentially the same problem. That's the end of this level. Now we get onto the next level, so that's noted here. Distributed coordination, level two. Next few slides are on that. 
And um, this has some uh, rather uh, sort of mix of technologies, as we'll see. The first is extremely important, Zookeeper. Somehow, uh, let me say a sort of revolutionary technology. It came out of um, Google, I think, originally wrote the paper, which uh, defined uh, their version of this. And then Zookeeper was the Apache implementation of that Google, original Google paper. And it was a part of a dupe, because Google did MapReduce. I mean, and what is Zookeeper? It's a, effectively a um, coordination engine that allows you to solve the basic problem of, of distributed systems, of uh, doing reliable communication and storing and things like that, and provide these sort of these standards, sort of consistent uh, specification of what's going on in a way that is completely reliable. And so Zookeeper is a highly uh, robust, uh, redundant system that is used to do concurrent uh, computing in a reliable fashion. And it's used extensively, for instance, the Apache Storm, which we use to do um, um, streaming data, that uses Zookeeper. Um, notice that it has redundancy built in. There's not much, you can't possibly have a system designed to do consistency without this system itself being redundant. And um, it's, you know, if you want to have, say, some metadata that, that describes some key features of a distributed system, then you could use Zookeeper to keep track of that metadata so that you, you knew there was a unique um, value of a given ent entry in that metadata at any time. And this is used quite in commercially by companies like Yahoo and eBay. And also, in, I mentioned Storm, another one which is Solar, which is a variant of Lucene, an interface to Lucene, uh, the search engine. And um, they also use Zookeeper internally. Uh, here, I just happen to notice this area probably needs more research. There is a technology from China. Uh, well-known university, HUST in, in Wuhan, and they have an improvement on Zookeeper, which I thought was pretty interesting, although it doesn't, I'm not certain they're making it a production service. It illustrates that a better Zookeeper is probably both needed and certainly possible. That's what the purpose of this draft paper is. Whether they're the right solution, Given in this world we live today, you need to have a huge team of people to make your system keep up with life. Uh, we'll have to see. Here's a rather totally different system. It's just here for convenience. This is an open source Java technology called J Groups. And this concerns um, sending messages to lots of places. Um, it's again open source. Typically, when it's open source, I'll tell you the license. Where Apache or BSD is probably the preferred license, but LGPL is not a bad license. So when you have a transport protocol, it goes from A to B. Uh, when you want to do a multicast, or which is a subset of broadcast, you're going from A to B1, B2, B3, dot, 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 B sub N. And there are many approaches to doing that in an efficient fashion, because it is not usually the most efficient to say start at your uh, source of the uh, messages and send out. For if you have n objects in your in your um, group, you don't necessarily want to send n messages. Rather, you can hierarchically break those, uh, send it out, and then um, break up the messages to multiple different uh, clients in a uh, at later on in the stage. <clears throat> and um, this has got various characteristics, which are basically to, to ensure that you have reliable, predictable messaging. And um, because one of the whole problem, well, this is typically with, um, you know, I don't know, your, your mobile, when you have a collection of people, I don't know, like students listening. Remotely to this class, then that this class material. Uh, one approach to it, which is the streaming approach, is to broadcast it 
to all people similar, uh, in this fa fashion. So J Groups is a toolkit, and it uh, allows you to create the groups, and um, then you can do these, um, you know, point to point. That's uh, point to point plus point point one by point two plus point three, and um, it has all the necessary logic to do this. And um, it had out one interesting feature which we found very useful, not actually for J groups, but for related projects, is to have a flexible protocol stack. And uh, because sometimes you want to do UDP if you're broadcasting uh, or multicasting video, you'd want UDP. And if you, um, another time you might want to use TCP, and a third time you might want to use the Java message service, which is uh, publish subscribe technology. Which is sort of you like higher level than TCP. JMS itself probably is usually implemented on top of TCP. But these are all different uh, messaging systems which you need to support, and J Groups allows you to support them so that it captures for all users the different technologies needed to do these uh, sending information to multiple different places. All right, now we have the third layer. Now, this is a huge layer. And our discussion does not do it justice. Um, uh, as actually, in general, in these cross cutting layers, we've actually selected a rather few uh, choices of technologies here. So uh, here we just have a few security and privacy uh, technologies that are particularly relevant to the, uh, uh, the other 13 layers, the ones that we have four cross cutting and 13 non cross cutting. Here are some curative privacy layer uh, technologies which are pretty relevant. The first is um, Keystone. So Keystone is a fa famous uh, technology. It's built into OpenStack, and it's the way OpenStack uh, does authentication uh, for keeping keeping track of the authorization and capabilities of users and administrators and things like that. Um, <coughs> So we have, uh, this is a, a so-called identity management. Here's the uh, OpenStack identity service, um, which is uh, keeps track of users. And the user here is either a person or a service or a system. And uh, we also divide those users up into tenants, which are containers. And um, like uh, you know, we could have uh, like again for class could have uh, lots of users all associated with that grouping called a class. And here we have a favorite, uh, one of the famous authorization approaches, rule based. Um, actually, this is not rule based; it's role based. <laughs> yeah, this is a mistake. Let's call this role based. Because rule is not the normal one, it's usually role. So let's assume there's a bungle, and it's really role based. And um, the reason why roles are attractive is that you assign roles, to, uh, users to roles, and then you can um, associate the capabilities of roles. You could have an administrator role, and an administrator role is able to do all sorts of devastating things. You could have a student role. Well, students are probably not able to do so much, and so that's their, their capabilities are limited. Um, and therefore, you um, by assigning roles, then when you get a user, remember this user is rather generalized. Um, then you can see what roles that user has, and then associated with every role, there is a, is a, a set of allowed capabilities, and that's how Keystone operates. Sentry is uh, another role-based um, system. It uh, came from Cloudera, uh, the Impala system, and it's used by Impala and Hive. And it was moved to Apache in just uh, a couple of years, uh, a year actually, a year ago, August 2013. This lecture is given in October 2014. And um, Quite whether this will take off, uh, you know, like a lot of Apache systems, especially those donated by companies, they may or may not get taken over because multiple things are donated, which have overlapping capabilities. But uh, at least this points out there is an Apache, a role-based authorization system. Here we have the final uh, 
um, layer monitoring. And again, we only have a subset of possible monitoring systems. And most of these, uh, apart from the first one, actually come from the high performance computing arena. HPC and grid computing always use monitoring extensively. So the first one we have is actually not from that, it's from the uh, cloud community, Hortonworks, a well known uh, systems house uh, doing a big data. And Ambari is a cluster management and monitoring approach. Again, when you're looking at clusters, you have all sorts of capabilities, monitoring, scheduling, managing. And they, they are all sort of mixed up in a way that you will come even more complex when we get to DevOps and see that you actually can start off by uh, taking virtual clusters, instantiating that from scratch. And so there's a rich set of initial capabilities. And the Ambari is just one of these uh, uh, things, which is, which is basically set up uh, especially to work with Hadoop, which is of course a dominant big data technology. And it allows you to set up your Hadoop services and install it for the with, from an interface. And this also actually has this back end capability, which is, I don't know, like maybe it's like Rocks, which is a famous uh, cluster pro, uh, automated installation system from San Diego. And um, Again, I don't know whether this is going to take off and get used, but it's certainly an important capability. You need to be able to instantiate your cluster, automatically load software on it, manage the up automatic updates of the software and things like that. Um, you need, of course, here to look at your Hadoop services and uh, modify their configurations, assess your cluster. Where Maybe get bigger or maybe smaller as you as you want for your Hadoop system, and then it also has, and this is why I see it also has the ability to monitor Hadoop cluster, and you can have a set of alerts which um, allows you to get get notified when a particular uh, type of event happens, and so you can make certain that you're actually a healthy Hadoop installation. Here we have Nagios, which is a um, very famous uh, system, been used for a long time. It's GPO, which is not your favorite uh, open source um, license. And it does um, similar things uh, to the uh, previous system, but uh, actually with a slightly broader context. It is not special to Hadoop. It does monitoring of the computers and the networking and the overall infrastructure, including the software. And it particularly focuses on having a very good alerting system so that it tells you when things go wrong and also when they go right. And there is, uh, like in many software systems, an open source version and a closed source, namely commercial version, with additional features and robustness and support. And here we have typical pictures you get, uh, um, here's your, Web interface to, to Nagios. Here you have a status, a list of status of the system, and here you have um, actually here you have uh, services as a function of, of time and uh, the usage of those services. Typically, monitoring will tell you when you're using it, how well you're using your system, how much you're using your system, and things like that. You can tell from when it's not being used, when you're wasting your computers and maybe when they're overburdened. Here we have Ganglia, which is uh, another important system of this type. Um, Ganglia and Nagios are actually relatively similar. This is a BSD license. Uh, it comes directly from high performance computing community. And it allows you to, it's particularly good at uh, producing um, visualizations and uh, logs of actually, you know, how much your CPU is used and how much your network is used. Here you see, um, as it says here, Gangly is really uh, good at gathering metrics and tracking them over time. And Nagios has a focus of, um, of um, alerting people when things here. So here we actually have some. Uh, Grid technologies, probably from the uh, 
this one it was probably the from Fermilab, FNAL is Fermilab. So this is some particular grid used for uh, applications, and they're telling you how your um, how your load factor is going, and how, and uh, as a function of time in terms of memory and CPU use. So finally, we have the Inca system. It's also open source <coughs> from San Diego. Uh, our, actually, our collaborators on uh, Future Grid. And we use it extensively on Future Grid. And it's a uh, user level. It's used typically at a higher level, uh, more macroscopically than Ganglia and uh, Nagios. And uh, it also has very useful features. It does checks. So we, we automatically reused Inca to monitor the health of the Future Grid components. And in fact, it has reporters which allow you to do these tests. And we have, for instance, have 196 reporters were used in Future Grid. And uh, here it tells you, for instance, uh, Inca is telling you <coughs> for several of the machines in Future Grid uh, how they're being used and um, for different types of technologies. Eucalyptus and Nimbus are particular cloud technologies. There's OpenStack, and here's high performance computing. You notice we have some offline nodes, some miscellaneous nodes, uh, some experimental people screwing around with them, and so on. And this tells you then uh, on a regular basis. It updates it, and actually this is all displayed online automatically. And so you have a good idea of what's going on. So that's the last of uh, this uh, set of technologies. And uh, the next <coughs> next set is that uh, we actually go on to the core layers, starting at the bottom with the cloud and infrastructure layers, and going up to the top, which is orchestration. Thank you very much. This is uh, Jeffrey Fox ending this uh, discussion of the cross-cutting technologies, layers or levels one to four of HPC ABDS. Thank you.